out. Okay. All is good. And we'll start broadcasting in about a minute. So. Okay. I'm actually very excited about this one because I think this is uh, something that's desperately needed mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in the communication. No matter how much we educate, they still don't have all the facts that they need. So this is great. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. So, it's amazing how long a minute lasts when you're waiting for a minute to happen. <laughs> okay, so here we go. We are going live. Hello, welcome uh, to Life's Copilot's uh, continuing ser series of, uh, of events. If you can't understand me, it's because I have a mouthful of cotton. I had uh, oral surgery about an hour ago, so this is going to be interesting. We'll see <laughs> if we can get through this together. Um, Today is, is about something, let me get to, let me do a real quick screen share so you can kind of see what I'm thinking about and we'll, and we'll come back to all of our panelists. So here we go. So on our screen share, Life's Copilot, if you go to events, this is something you can learn about for future events as well. When you go to events here, hopefully it actually will decide to load. Um, today, we are doing something that I think is, is something that's very personal to me because I had no idea how hospice really works. So, boy, it is taking us time to load today. Anyway, the most misunderstood word in senior care or really in, any, in care generally uh, is hospice. Why most people miss out on the benefits uh, available to them and a better quality of life uh, because they don't know what it means. Our speakers today are Cheryl uh, um, Molder Agui uh, with Guardian Angel Hospice, Craig Stahl with Heartland Hospice, Linda Hope with Traditions Hospice. Uh, Michael is supposed to be showing up here shortly. He's trying to connect uh, with Physicians Care and Penny Davis with Abby Hunt Bryce Home. So I'm going to go back to our panelists here and we'll start uh, going through the roster. So Cheryl, right now your face is the first one that I see here on the thing. So I'll let you get us started. Hey, um, my name's Cheryl Molnar Ag. I'm with Guardian Angel Hospice. We are a privately owned company. We've been around for about 20 years. Um, five women started our company um, back about 20 years ago. And the focus was really just to support the families just as much as the patients, because you know we know that if we support both sides, um, it's a win-win. Um, our focus really is just on uh, aromatherapy. We have a, a great program with our aromatherapy, so that's how we're different. We do a lot of great things with communication, um, as well as extra visits, as long as it goes along with the care plan. Well, thank you. So, uh, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Thanks for asking uh, me to come on and uh, enjoy the, the screen time with these ladies. Um, uh, just again, like you said, just explaining and helping come to more of an understanding of what uh, hospice is uh, and what it is not. I am with Heartland Hospice. We are the largest uh, non-for-profit hospice in the country, um, and we uh, are all over the country. So I've uh, been started off in Fort Wayne and have been here in the Indianapolis market for 20 plus years. So I'm just uh, glad to be a part. Thank you, Craig. And by the way, I want to give you a heads up. Craig is the one that best explained what hospice was to me about a year ago. I thought he did a great job. So I'm looking forward to having that pour out again. So um, Linda, your sound's off, huh? That helps. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Linda with Transitions Hospice. Um, we're here in Indianapolis. We're going on our sixth year. We're based in Illinois. We are a mom and pop, so we are a small um, hospice company. And one of our main focus is into life uh, presence. In the month of August, we were present at 100% of our deaths. The national average is about 13%. So um, that's something we're real proud of. And we um, do all our best to be there at time of death. Thank you. Uh, Penny. Hi, everyone. And, and thank you again, Jim, for inviting me as well as all the others. Uh, it's a great topic, and I'm looking forward to sharing. I work with the Abbey Hunt Bryce Home. I'm the Provider Relations Manager. And so it's a little different than what the other panelists are speaking about because they're with the agencies, but we work with all those agencies. The Abbey Hunt Bryce Home was opened in 2004. 
for, and we are what I call the homeless hospice. So those folks that are in the community that are homeless or don't have a safe home or living in some of the missions or the shelters that need hospice care can come to us for that opportunity. And it is, of course, free to them. So it's a little different than some of the others, but I work with most of these agencies. And so I think, you know, collectively, we're all about, whether it's myself or the other agencies, quality end of life care. And this is just such a rewarding thing to be able to do for those people that live in our community or any of the contiguous counties to come to the Abbey Hemp Bryce home. We have a nice leadership team, CNAs that work in the home, and we work collectively with each of the agencies to provide the care for the patient that's outlined in their care plan. So, Excellent. Michael, I see you're here. Hi, I finally, finally made it on. Uh, my name is Michael Bremsky. I work for PhysioCare Hospice. We are based out of Lafayette, Indiana, but we serve over 30 counties throughout Indiana. Um, we do palliative care all the way up through hospice care. Um, we're one of the smaller companies in the area, as in it, we're a small privately owned company. We're not a national chain or anything, so we, uh, we, we service a pretty large area, but we're, we're pretty tight knit. So um, we've had our hospice division for, it'll be six years come this uh, winter, and uh, we're just excited to continue to grow throughout Indiana and help folks just uh, experience hospice and, and get all the help that they can get. Excellent. Well, I'll tell you what, that's a great jumping off point too. You brought up palliative care and, and hospice. And by the way, if my pronunciation is bad, give me, you know, I'm, I'm chewing on cotton. <laughs> so anyway, um, so anyway um, Michael, let's start there. What's the difference? Explain what each is. Um, so with palliative care, that's something that would start a little sooner than hospice care. Um, hospice care is when all interventive uh, measures have ceased. So if somebody has cancer, if they are on chemotherapy, uh, they, if the, the hospice diagnosis or if, if they're on hospice because of the cancer diagnosis, um, they can't continue that chemotherapy. While they're on palliative care, they can uh, still continue with preventative and, and uh, attempting curative measures to be able to um, help them feel better, kind of help quell uh, quite some of that, um, the pain and some of the um, anxiety that somebody might, uh, might come up with. So basically, I mean, just generally palliative can happen while treatment is still going on and hospice happens when treatment ends and people inevitably prepare for uh, the end. Well, I'm going to do a follow-up question on that because this is a, you know, um, I never even heard of palliative care until I got into the senior services industry. Okay. You know, my father could have possibly benefited from that. There's, you know, so I'm going, how do people find out about it? You know, let's just stay on that for just a second here because we want to cover that topic too. I was going to uh, interject in there too. With palliative care, we also do that. And sometimes when people are on hospice, they actually graduate because of the additional care that they're getting. Mm -hmm. And they come off hospice. And so they roll, it's very fluid, then they go right onto our palliative program, um, where our nurse practitioner then follows them, goes to their home, wherever their home is, and visits them along with their social worker. And then if they want to go back on home health um, or start doing chemotherapy, all of that, then she, we coordinate and work with all the primary doctors and, and uh, keep it very fluid and still keep comfort for them. So there's the opposite too, before you go on hospice. So also sometimes you go off hospice, go on palliative. And then if there's a decline, we're still in there to quickly put them back on hospice. Mm -hmm. so, Excellent. Thank you. So let's just, like, you know, we're kind of on this thing. What is hospice? I mean, let's, let, you know, I think what a lot of people think is that, you know, again, I, I know about what my experience was. My dad went on hospice. The doctor called it in and it happened. Literally, she got there five minutes after dad passed. And so I was glad because she did all the paperwork. Okay. So I didn't have to do that. But I think a lot of people think it's a morphine drip in the last couple of days. So could you explain a little bit more about what it is, you know? So, and this is for all of you, please start weigh in. Well, it's, you know, it's not curative. It's um, really, we come together with all of our disciplines to provide a quality, their quality of life. 
Um, and again, not only just the patient, but the family as well together as a unit. Um, we really feel like supporting the family and educating them really takes off uh, the weight on their shoulders and they can truly um, become a son or daughter again and so forth and not just a caregiver because um, that that is, you know, I know when my mom was on service nine years ago, and by the way, my background is I'm a school teacher, an education degree, and hospice was really a life-changing ministry decision for me. Um, you know, the support, I, I was exhausted at the time. Um, my mom lived in Chicago, and I lived in Noblesville for 25 years, um, and my dad had passed a long time before that, so I'm the oldest of four, and we were just trying to coordinate everything. And when that hospice nurse walked in, and that team, it was game over. Like I felt a, re a huge relief, like I had not felt in a really long time, with all of the different disciplines that could could join and help us out. Um, so it's about really creating um, the best possible life the time that you have and like Linda said sometimes you know our patients will graduate because of all the extra care but um, you know our nurses have been known to as long as it's okay with the diet um, bringing in chocolate shakes um, getting the family together um, for um, you know lots of different things holidays or um, surprise birthdays or something like that. All those little extra things mean so much to the patient and the families. Anybody else want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, absolutely, you know, that is the piece. It's, it's, it's not just, this is the one Medicare benefit that's not just for the individual. It's for that whole family um, mm -hmm. to provide that support. So um, kind of to piggyback off what Mike had said as well, you know, when Hospice is for those folks who have exhausted all of the curative uh, measures. Um, so those folks that, you know, there's a, a, a slow decline. Um, hopefully it's a slow decline and not just a, a rapid decline. Um, but, uh, you know, for those folks who are on that slow decline and there's uh, recovery is not, uh, not necessarily something that the physician feels like they can do anymore. So, you know, that uh, then hospice is invited in and, uh, just to come alongside the family, support them, and uh, make sure that the patient is comfortable. I think the thing that I always try to teach when I'm talking to families is what hospice is and what hospice isn't. And so that can kind of define it for them because it's all new. It's just like we've discussed. Many people, until they need it, don't really know about it. And then they don't understand how it really affects them and how they can benefit from them. And I always, sometimes they'll say, well, I don't know when, when I can go to hospice. And I say, well, hospice is not somewhere you're going to go to. It is not someplace that it's a program of care. And we're going to give it to you, whether it's in your home or a skilled facility or at the Abbey Hunt Bryce home or wherever it might be. And when you start talking about the team and the support, because all of you know, as I do, that each family is different. Each diagnosis is a little different. Some need a lot more clinical care. Some will need a lot more social work. Some really need this, the chaplain. And so we have that whole collective interdisciplinary team. It is wonderful that we can serve the whole patient and the family. And then of course the family for 13 months afterwards. But, and I talk about what it isn't, just as we alluded to a moment ago, it is not waiting till the very last day that you're ill and think then, okay, I'm, now I'm ready to have hospice. It is not giving them an IV and starting morphine and to go to sleep that day. People say that to me all the time. You know, it's also not that they're gonna be alone or that they have to go to a room by themselves. It's, it's just so much more. And even though we've had hospice in this country for many, many years, it is still a big educational process every single day to make sure that we orient people to the wonderful opportunities. And of course, if they have Medicare, all those services, you know, where sometimes I would see people who were living on the couch at home or someone else's home, and when they found out they could have a comfortable bed or their medications were going to be provided, it was a resource they had no idea was available to them. So I just think it's just a wonderful opportunity that we all can continue to educate and promote to, to everyone who might need it for them or their families or their friends. Very good. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Hopefully, our patients don't wait till too late, like your father did. Unfortunately, I don't know his situation. That's very sad. Yeah. Enjoy hospice, and we've all—I'm sure everybody on this panel 
I've gotten a patient that's passed within a couple of hours of coming on hospice. And how you get to those families, it can be difficult, you know, and then they're like, oh, had we known? And we all try to reach out in the community and try to educate um, mm -hmm. that this could be at the beginning, not at the end. Of course, we're going to give them the same services. The other thing with hospice, the relief is our nurses work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. We do two 12-hour shifts. So we don't triage calls. We are actually out working in the field. So at two o'clock in the morning, if you have your loved one at home and something is wrong, you call us, we come out. Um, sure. And uh, to have that relief, knowing that we're available to come out. And when the time comes, we make daily visits. You know, we make tuck-in visits. So you get, yeah. we help you live through that journey. And that's, and that's why we're here to help you live um, during this time and follow your journey. But it's that word hospice that kind of stabs you on the side, you know, thinking, oh, my. And the families that actually do get on um, early on love and enjoy it. And we always, I always tell them, you become our family, you know, because we get so yeah. close to families because we're in their home, yeah. you know, yeah. their facility. Right. We're That's with right. them all the time, you know. And uh, it's as hard as on us. It's very hard on the staff, too, when we lose our patients because – we know what the journey is, but you become so close to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hope that, I don't know how you get the word out, because I know we've all tried um, to continue to educate that when you are no longer seeking aggressive treatment is when you can, hospice can come really? in and really well, give you support. Linda, One of the things I tag on to that is I always say to my, my families, my patients, you're not coming to us to die. You're coming to live the rest of your life with us. Mm. And it seems to kind of ease it a little bit, whether it's this position or my former position before I retired when I ran all over the country doing hospice. It's just, there's, you're, you're so correct. They're so afraid of that word until you can kind of alleviate that for them and give them some comfort that a whole team is coming to help. And whether it's midnight or Christmas morning or whenever, or middle of a snowstorm, there's going to be help come to them if they need it. Yeah. You know, and I think to, to that end as well, like Linda spoke to about the education. I, I've talked to many families that have said, well, I, I thought that the physician would let me know when hospice was. And um, unfortunately, as, as we all know, um, the physicians uh, usually kind of wait for somebody else to refer, whether it be the primary care yeah. physician or yeah. a specialist. Yeah. Um, or even the hospital, um, they all think somebody else is having that discussion. Um, and then to what end, families aren't sure either. So, you know, to, you know, we let people know, hey, you can initiate this and the hospice team can work with the physician to get the order sure. and identify eligibility. But uh, yeah, that's such a big piece is that education uh, to, the, to the community, but then also to, uh, to the medical community as well. I also think it's really important for the patients and the families to understand, and I always explain this to them, that this is their journey. You know, we're an extra set of hands. We're extra support. But ultimately, you know, if we think that, you know, maybe the, the best thing would be the pain meds because it seems like they're showing signs of that, you don't want to do that as a patient. That is your choice. This is, you know, and, and truly kind of respecting everybody's ideas of what the journey looks like. The families might all have some different ideas. Um, ultimately, the patient gets to decide if they're able to, but um, that usually takes a lot of anxiety out because we're just here to help you in any way. We're an extra set of hands, so we're not going to give you morphine and put you, you know, into a deep sleep. Um, that is up to you as far as just, you know, we have an aromatherapy program and some of our patients don't want to go on any kind of medications at the beginning and they just want to start off with some aromatherapy and kind of go in that way. So. Very good. I, will, I will tell you that, I don't know, Craig, or maybe you that said this to me, but um, I'll way back, but what really stuck in like that light bulb that went off for me was the difference in doctors are trained in curative care and their whole focus is trying to get you over whatever it is that's going on 
And when the, you get to a point where that is not going to happen, whatever you have is a is not going to cure, they really are kind of at a wit's end. They can give you painkillers, but that's about all they can do. Whereas hospice comes in and they treat the symptoms rather than the cause to increase uh, quality of life. I mean, is that kind of what, I, again, I'm, I'm going to give you credit for it, Craig, because I think that's where I heard it, but I just, it was like, oh, I get it, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and that's perfect. The piece, it's, it's the piece that, you know, doctors are, they have training and, and curative and helping people um, to fix an ailment, but they, you know, maybe have a few weeks of palliative hospice end of life care training. So there's just not a lot of training there. Um, and though, Many say, you know, I do say they, they know and I, I do utilize hospice. Um, uh, statistically, it's just shown that they don't. According to Medicare, 52% of people who are eligible pass away without service at all. Mm -hmm. um, and of the remaining, the people who do get it, 60% um, uh, of them pass away within two weeks of coming on hospice. So it's so far underutilized because nobody is identifying those folks uh, soon enough. Um, our partners that we all have, that are the usually the most successful are are those in an assisted living in a nursing home where they have identified those declines. Um, but you know we encourage families all the time. Hey, if you've noticed a decline, need more help, and you don't feel like mom is recovering, uh, you know this is that's where you know you initiate that, and we're you know we're happy to come alongside you and work with you in that. But, uh, but yeah, it's it's not uh, you know I always tell people too it's it, it's not the last couple uh, weeks of life. Um, Medicare says, hey, if you have a diagnosis that could take your life within six months, this, uh, this is the service for you. So, you know, that education piece, I, I talked to a family one time and they said, now is hospice where you don't give them anything to eat or drink? Um, and so it's that sad misconception of, of what maybe what somebody's experience was in the past. Just to take along with what you're saying, Craig, I've heard that as well, but sometimes people will say, well, I don't have cancer, so I don't qualify. There's still mm -hmm. that that everything with hospice is oncology related instead of all the multiple diagnoses that are accepted now with hospice. So that's another piece to educate, whether it's respiratory or cardiac or renal or any of the others, neurology, that they're all that broad spectrum of diagnosis that are accepted with hospice. Well, and some people are just, no matter what profession you are in, are uncomfortable talking about end of life. Of course. You know, and uh, it's easier for us because we do it, you know. But, I mean, how many times are you at a cocktail party? Maybe not today with COVID. <laughs> so when they say, so what do you do for a living? And you say work for hospice, and you can end a conversation right away. Oh, yeah, right. You know? <laughs> so, I mean. To get, you know, we're the ones with the comfortable conversations and it's hard to get people comfortable whether they're, I mean, you guys have been in assisted livings where even the director yeah. of nursing and the executive director are uncomfortable with it. Can you yeah. kind of talk to this family? We think it's time, you know, and so it is, it, those are hard conversations to have and the family normally is relief, relieved or the patient knowing that there is a plan you know, available yeah. to them. So that's a whole other discussion is getting comfortable with talking about end of life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the earlier, the better, like, you know, anything, the, you know, if you're having that conversation six months before versus two weeks before, um, and that's all you do with it, you just hold on to that for a while, let them, you know, absorb the information and the education. Um, it seems less scary when it's time to come on to service. Mm -hmm. um, and then going back to what Jim and Craig said, you know, um, we're experts, we're all experts at um, looking at the whole person in the situation. So um, looking at their pain level, how they're sleeping, um, their, you know, uh, kind of spiritual being, their emotional mm -hmm. being, like we have all the disciplines that really work together as a, you know, family to help them through that and balance those things out. Um, again, with it looking, getting back to focusing on it's their journey. Um, and so sure. we, however they need and feel like um, it's their right to do that. One of the things that was coming up was the people were missing out on the services because they didn't know they were putting off 
could you explain what the services are? What, what, is it, what is it that you can bring to the table for people that, they, that they're missing out on? <coughs> Just in general, what kind of services could be? What kind of things that, you know, I mean, Grant, you can come there, but I mean, there's, I, I've been told of all these different uh, things that are also part of it that Medicare will pay for, that are part of the things that people aren't aware of. So could you kind of fill in all the, you know, some of the different services that, would be provided with a with a hospice relationship. Oh, I'm missing. Uh, no, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> We're all going to start at once. <laughs> we can all take one, maybe. Um, so one of the disciplines um, we have is the social worker. We we have four plus a volunteer usually with the nurse, the social worker, Uh, the chaplain and the aide and then the volunteers, but the social worker can work with um, people that have fi family dynamics. Um, and we all have a couple of family dynamics in every family, most of us. Um, so our social worker is really trained to work with the family because again, they might have a different relationship with that patient. Um, and so the social worker kind of, you know, talks to them about kind of honoring that e each person has a different relationship and let them meet that patient where they're at. Um, there's things like, for instance, if they're in a facility and they're not happy in the facility or the family's not happy, our social worker can work on transfers to different either assisted livings or skilled facilities. Um, and really just kind of getting everything together from um, helping out with planning, pre-planning with the funeral, um, anything that's basically the nurse, the aide and the chaplain are not able to do, usually the social worker will kick it into high gear and just um, help with any of that. Can you guys add to any of, any of that? Yeah, I was going to add respite care. So yeah. under the Medicare yeah. benefit, say you're at home and your loved ones are exhausted or say your spouse wants to go away for the weekend, under the Medicare benefit, they will pay for a five-day stay at a skilled building. Mm -hmm. And um, and we follow them there. We help, and that's where your social worker, at least ours, does normally. And the director of nursing coordinates that, and um, it's to give the uh, the caregiver a break and to guarantee that the patient is still getting twenty four hour care and that they don't lose any services. And that's um, that's a I think a lot of times people for you know don't utilize that as much. Right now it's a little different. I know with yeah. COVID, but. Um, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, you know, in, in, in addition to, you know, the skilled care with the nurse, nurse's aide, chaplain, social work that uh, Cheryl talked about, um, the other, you know, there's a couple other big benefits. You know, one is the durable medical equipment that hospice provides. And Penny hit on that a while back about, you know, those people who are sleeping on a couch or sleeping in the lazy boy and things, and which isn't helping their heart condition either and things, but uh, all of those pieces. So we bring in durable medical equipment. So um, anything that could fall in that category, a hospital bed, um, a, a shower chair, a wheelchair, a walker, um, a bedside commode uh, over the bed table. So, you know, anything that would help the patient be more comfortable, um, as well as provide support to that family uh, in, in providing care. And to kind of piggyback off of what Cheryl said as well with the social workers, is, um, and I know, I think Cheryl also mentioned it before that we don't just take care of somebody's uh, physical being, but their spiritual being is also a, a big part of hospice care. Um, so I know that we have chaplains available who can do uh, spiritual counseling with families and they're gonna be there, they're gonna be available 24 hours a day to chat with them. Um, and then that kind of piggybacks onto our bereavement that inevitably when somebody passes off of um, hospice care, and, um, you know, if they're trying to cope with it or they're having any issues, um, our chaplains are there. And, and usually, I mean, we'll follow up with a family up to a year after when somebody passes away. I know my father passed away in April and we, we signed him up for hospice care. And uh, earlier this week, the chaplain from the hospice agency that uh, was servicing him in Pennsylvania gave me a call just to chat, see how I was doing. And, um, you know, once I asked about my daughter and how the memorial service went. So there's there's a lot of other benefits that don't just deal with a person's physical self, but they'll also kind of deal with that spiritual and emotional part as well. I guess I would circle back to the clinical piece. Um, 
because we've kind of touched on some of the other aspects of the care plan, but when that nurse first admits the patient, that person can really get a pulse on what's going on to get the patient comfortable so that all these other aspects can fall into place. And, you know, whether it's a comfort in a bed or there's comfort with pain or they haven't eaten, they need hydrated or any number of aspects because people will react differently to pain medications and maybe they can't swallow anymore. So we can do something sublingual, but there's a lot of aspects that let's just get the patient comfortable in the right bed with the right support and the right team. And then once they're comfortable, someone will say, I really need to speak to my chaplain. Now that I'm not in so much pain, I need to speak to my chaplain. I have unresolved issues or I need the social worker to help me with whatever that might be. And that's what I love about this is that it's a team. No one person has to do every job, but collectively we all support each other so that you have the right to say, you know what, I'm gonna call in the social worker and she's gonna come chat with you a little bit about this family member that you haven't seen for 20 years that you cannot die until you get that piece resolved. And sometimes those are the aspects of the, the whole care plan that keep them from being comfortable and relaxing because they have unresolved issues. So I love the fact that we can all support each other. And as Linda alluded to, um, there are four programs of care. Most of it's always routine, but if the family needs a break, there's respite care. If the patient really has critical needs, you can put them in the IPU, which is an inpatient unit or the, the old continuous care piece. But we have this fabulous program of hospice that really meets the patient's needs. And as a team, it's our responsibility to make sure that we all reach out and serve that patient and their family and let them just be a family because all of us are supposed to be the caregivers now. The one thing about that that I often find needs reiterated a number of times is they don't seem to understand sometimes that the hospice nurse is not going to just stay with them. They still need that care person in the home, whether it's a family member or a neighbor or someone they hire, the nurse can come and go. And many times there's not a, a limit onto the number of visits, but they're not just going to move in with you. And so sometimes that takes a little bit of uh, retraining on people to do that. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that there's also a volunteer, and again, not right now because of COVID, but that person can come in and paint their fingernails, read to them, pray with them, do whatever might need to be done. And it also is a really integral part of the team, which of course is, is part of being the state licensed, the Medicare certified. But I, I think that we have this opportunity to reach out to each person on our team and discuss that when you have your interdisciplinary team meetings and then that physician can say, okay, I'm hearing you say that the pain is not managed, so let's titrate that drug up or let's do something different. And then we all go about our business and do what needs to be done. And it's just such a rewarding thing to see that patient finally settle in and be comfortable and be able to have that quality end of life care that we all, no matter who we work for, that's always our goal, Absolutely. end of life care. So. The other thing I was gonna talk about was payer source. That might be a question. Yes you know, how this is covered. So do you want to go over that, Penny, since you also do homeless? So um, well, Medicare, Medicaid? Yeah, everything can kind of uh, interact with that. But we'll just start with Medicare because that's how this kind of all got um, certified many, many years ago, but like it's 1982. But Medicare will come in and people will often say to me, um, I, I don't have any money on it. I have to make a decision with my retirement money or my a little bit of income, whether I buy food or I buy my medicine. I mean, how many times have you heard that? So when you go on Medicare, then that really encompasses all your care. It's your DME, it's your bed, your wheelchair, the potty, the walker, anything that you might need, but particularly that comfortable bed so that they have some place to sleep and they're not on the floor uh, or on a couch somewhere or just uncomfortable. And then when they go on, the Medicare benefit will pay for all their medications that are pertinent to the terminal diagnosis. So nobody has to worry anymore whether they can pay their medication bill to have pain management controlled. So there's that aspect of it. And then the team, you know, everybody has the whole team that is <clears throat> encompassed into that. The other thing I've, I love about it is when the patient's gone, the benefit doesn't just stop because bereavement care is followed for 13 months afterwards for the family. And just as um, I think it was Michael said a moment ago, somebody checked on him much later after the death. And that's sometimes when it all hits you. 
and you don't think, I don't have the money to go hire a psychologist or someone to counsel me. Boy, I still really need to talk about what's happened to me in my family. So that aspect of it. Medicaid has a program as well and covers a number of these issues. There's a lot of different Medicaid programs. Uh, insurance, of course, if the patient's younger, we have a lot of younger patients and they may have an insurance policy, it gets case managed. And so that's when you really kind of say, okay, here's what I need. And you go back and forth to make sure it's case managed and appropriately covered. The last thing you want to do is leave a patient and family with a lot of bills that were pertinent to this diagnosis. So we try to take each one individually um, and all those policies, whether it's Medicaid or it's insurance, are all different. They'll cover different aspects of the disease. They'll cover different lengths of time for the disease. Um, but the majority of it, you know, is, is hospice. There's, you know, of course, patients will come off of that are younger that'll have the Medicare benefit because they're in-stage renal disease or something else. It doesn't have to be somebody over 65. But we really try to just take over that piece for them so that the patient and the family are not worried about the bills. Yeah, I think to, to add to that too, so in addition, like she said, the DME, the medication linked to the diagnosis, but then another big expense for, for many folks are the incontinence supplies. So the hospice yes. also does cover uh, the incontinence supplies. So, uh, you know, pull-ups or brief, um, uh, whether it be, you know, the pad covers, uh, wipes, gloves, all of those things uh, is a big cost savings as well. So yeah, thanks Penny for uh, explaining those pieces. Yeah. They're so overwhelmed and anything that you can take off of their shoulders and explain to them or just say, we've got this covered. I don't want you to worry about it. I want you to just be with your family. We got this covered. The supplies are going to be there for you. The care is going to be there for you. Um, the one thing that I've always taught the teams, you know, and when I had different areas of the country is that on the refrigerator where people know where the refrigerator is and aren't going to lose a piece of paper is do not call 911. <laughs> call the hospice office and an on-call person or your nurse will come to your rescue. The moment you call 911, they're obligated to treat and that person does not want to be put on a, you know, they just don't want to have to be carted off to the hospital and obligated to treat and it's cold outside or it's hot outside or it's any number of things. They are at home and they want to be comfortable there but they need help so you call the office because people panic, that's the first thing they do. Mm -hmm. Again, that's just another piece of the education with the programs at home, so. Well, this is excellent. Uh, we've covered this in certain areas and you know, it's kind of like, how do you access it? Um, you know, we, I think somebody mentioned about, you know, waiting for the, thinking the doctor is gonna say it and the other doctor thinks the other doctor is gonna say it or whatever. How do you as a family or whatever, or an individual know that maybe hospice might be available for, you know, like, you know, they, they, they talk about some things you have to like the ADLs, what different uh, activities of daily life are in there for certain things. For this, what kind of things are the cues of the, that go, oh, hey, maybe I ought to make a phone call? Well, I'll jump in on that. You know, I think oftentimes, you know, younger, uh, younger folks, at whatever young is, that's a fluid number or age, but, uh, you know, keeps getting younger, uh, keeps going to a higher level every day for me. It so, does. Yeah. For, yes, yes. So, you know, but if we get the flu, if we get uh, an illness of some sort, oftentimes we recover, you know, it takes a week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, but as you get older and your immune system is more compromised and your body starts to break down amongst other, uh, what are considered comorbidities, maybe heart and lung or any other number of things, your body does not recover as well. Um, we all do have an expiration date. Um, and at some point that, uh, you know, we all do meet that. And so I think those, those folks who, who we can look at and say, hey, as why we may we're having a bad day here, but are these bad days strung together and are we rebounding, getting better, or is this uh, just that slow decline? So um, that, that's always the hard thing to really identify, but it's never too soon to get hospice involved. Hospice, we all have accountability to Medicare, to Medicaid, like Penny had said, um, with the payer sources. Um, we will come out and evaluate, any hospice will do that, get records, come out and evaluate and identify. And if you're not eligible right now, you know, there's nothing to say in a month, two months, three months, we reevaluate and then maybe you are. So, um, you know, the, the worst thing is to, is your experience, Jim, where, 
it's it's uh, five minutes too late. Um, so you know, the earlier the better, um, and then just really able to help the help the families as well as the patient and things identify you know, what resources are available um, that you've already paid for through your, through your Medicare benefit. I would just also say to give some accolades to your sales teams, liaisons, marketing reps, whatever, any different agency uh, refers to those people because they are the people out in the community spreading the word. They're educating those physicians offices, those nurse practitioners, chaplains, people in the churches because people who are ill will sometimes say to someone, I don't know what my next step is. I don't know if my family member is going to get well. I don't know who to call next. And so, you know, accolades to the sales team who are out there in the physician's office is saying, you know, if you get someone, you have to be so cautious here. If you get someone who has exhausted all their interest in aggressive care and could use per, um, palliative care or hospice, please give us a call. Please help us have the opportunity to educate them. So, that's the whole rest of the team out in the community because as everyone's already said, the physicians, that's their, their practice. They're there to heal. When they can't heal, they don't know exactly what to do and sometimes they can't give that up quite yet. So um, when people really want to have um, quieter time and they'll say to me, I don't wanna be stuck anymore. I don't wanna have any more x-rays. I don't wanna have any more chemo or radiation, but I don't know what to do or who to help me. That's our opportunity to step in and. You know, just as Craig said, anybody will evaluate them and make sure that they would fit the admission criteria. So, but people in the community have to know, and there's, this is a fabulous thing that you've done today, Jim, to put this out for people to be able to listen and be educated and, you know, just get an idea of what they can expect from this resource. It is a big resource for them. Well, thank you. We, we, that's one reason that Life's Copilot exists is we, we're having a depository and a library where you can go in to, to see these types of, <laughs> Uh, educational opportunities so um do you have to wait you don't have to wait for the doctor to sign but let me ask you a question um do you have to wait for a, a, a diagnosis that you've got six months to live or something like that or you know what what's the cue point for you when you're doing your analysis I feel like my cottons keep slipping, but you know. Well, I, I feel like it's really important going back to what Penny said um, to educate the community so that the patients and the families are aware that it doesn't have to come from the doctor right away. You know, they can self refer if they have that education from us or whoever's out there in the community educating. If they see their loved one declining, or if the patient feels and sees that. It's just not where they want to be. They can have that conversation with the doctor. They can actually, we have a lot of patients do that, where they actually start that conversation with their doctor and say, hey, what do you think about this? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's really an important aspect. And we, I know all of us try to communicate as much as we can out there um, to give that confidence because a lot of people don't think they can do that. But it's, it's definitely something that, anyone could do. When it comes right down to it, yes, the doctor needs the order. Um, and, and to say that this person will have six months or less, if the disease process progresses at a normal rate, whatever, you know, that is for them. Um, and, and that definitely would need to be, but being able to refer yourself um, and us educating that is really a powerful um, tool to have. Joe, I've had families ask, you know, well, what happens if that six months they haven't passed away, you know, and um, so nobody knows exactly. Obviously, we're not God and able to say when uh, that person's going to pass. But, you know, like Cheryl said, if, if the disease continues its normal course, could it take your life in six months? Well, it could. Um, but we all have folks who we've cared for for longer than six months. Absolutely. Um, oh, you know, yes. Sometimes months over, sometimes quite a few months or even a year or more. Um, on the hospice service. Um, so, um, you know, again, I, I always encourage, it's never too early to at least start the conversation and, uh, and those evaluations. Mm -hmm. One other comment that I always make to people, which uh, I'm sure all of you have done as well, but it makes a difference to them. They'll say, I I'm just too sick. I can't go to the doctor anymore. I know I need something different. I can't go. And when you say to them, but all of your team is coming to you, 
you do not have to go out to the doctor anymore. The nurse is going to come to you. She's going to evaluate. She's going to report it back to the team. You can just be comfortable. We're going to take care of you. It makes such a difference to them. So. Mm -hmm. I think to, to piggyback off that too, it's also really important to let people know that just because you're starting the, the hospice uh, process doesn't mean that you lose your history as well. Um, one of the concerns I get from a lot of folks is, well, I've been with my primary care physician for 45 years. And uh, we always tell people, you know, you, you can keep your primary care physician. Sure. They're going to be a sure. part of the team. Um, right. Kind of like when you go to a mechanic, you're not just going to go to a new mechanic, give them a car and say, here you go, good luck. You're going to, you know, if you move, you put them in touch with who you've worked with in the past. And um, it, it helps us to get a lot more information and get a bigger picture too. So knowing that we are coming to you, but we're not going to come in blind is, I think is very, very reassuring for a lot of folks. Yeah, great point, Mike. I think in addition to that, you know, they're not giving up their physician. I let families know they're not giving up care. They are still in the driver's seat um, making those decisions on uh, on what we do and how we progress. Um, so you never um, are handcuffed, uh, say, oh man, I'd like to do this, but I can't, I have hospice now. Um, I always let families know they are still in control. Um, and to that end, uh, all of us have many nurses and, and nurses aides and a big team. Um, if a nurse or nurses aide just isn't quite connecting with the family, we can always switch that out. Um, but at the end of the day, a family is still in control if they say, hey, you know what, I think I just want to try a different hospice care. That's, op that's an option as well. So um, you're, not, uh, you know, you're not tied in. You are still in full control of your health care. Very good. Um, we have talked about this through this conversation about people that graduate off hospice. They come on and they get better. They may go to palliative. They may do whatever. Um, and I've heard of people you know, through probably people on this panel and others that people have been in, in, in hospice care off and on for years because of that, that process. Um, so with that said, what, um, uh, one of the things that I, am I just guessing this is because as you're treating the symptoms, they feel better, maybe they're eating better, maybe that they're sleeping better, maybe, I mean, you guys are the experts, I'm not, but what, what is causing that person that all of a sudden you go into this quote unquote hospice and next thing you know, they're, they're getting better and getting off of it? That's a couple things is sometimes with the nurse coming out, um, we're finding out that they're, they're not getting their fluids or maybe they have a urinary tract infection. And um, I know that most of us that are on this panel that we serve patients 18 and years older. Majority of our patients are probably much older. And as you know, um, when somebody's been married 55 or 60 years, I want to be the one taking care of my spouse. And even though they may be worn out, um, they may not be capable of giving them the full attention that they want to. So a lot of times it could be weight, it could be proper medications, um, we've all walked in houses where there's poly pharmacies, they've got three different pharmacies, you know, it could be the wrong combination of medicines. Um, but there has to be a decline to stay on hospice. So that is a Medicare requirement. It doesn't have to be a major decline, but it's got some type of decline. Mm -hmm. Home health, you have to get better. So it's left brain, right brain. If there's not a decline and they're actually getting better, then hospice is not what is is, going, is for them. So there's a couple of answers to that, how they get better. But in my, my um, experience, it seems to be a couple that um, need more help in the home, they get better, you know? So if anybody wants to key in on that, go right ahead. Yeah, I think it's the nail like, on the head. It's just yeah, coordinating the services. You did a good yeah. job. Hitting the nail on the head. It, somebody has to coordinate the services. Many times you're walking and saying, when were they last medicated? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Jeopardy was on TV. Well, you know, it, there's just not the coordination. So it's, it's a lot of factors. The okay, other piece I waiting to see right along with that is that that caregiver's tired. Sometimes they've been up all night too, and then they kind of forget. And so there's a lot of aspects to coordinating this so that the patient gets the care that they need and the caregiver is able to provide the service. 
Um, it's just keeping your eye on the ball, taking the pulse of what's going on in the home. I think it's also important to um, let the patient know that if they change their mind and the family together, you know, it's one signature. If they're getting better with our care and they want to pursue home health, that is absolutely okay. Um, it mm -hmm. is one signature. And then of course, when, you know, when it's time to go back on, we would have to go and do all the paperwork again and um, the assessment and everything. But um, that's, you know, that usually gives the patient and the families kind of like, okay, so there are some fluid things going on here. It's not like sometimes they look at it as they're signing their life away. And that's really not the case. No, you're right. Very good. Well, this next question came up in my head as we've been doing this today. I had, didn't have it prepared, but um, let's say, for instance, that someone, a family member, has watched this video today, or they've watched, or what have you, and now they're feeling much more educated, and we've got, you know, the empowered to, to do something about this, and now they're going to have that family discussion and they're the one that brings up hospice and everybody wants to jump down their throat because they're trying to kill mom or dad. So how would you coach someone that now knows more that's armed and, and maybe dangerous, they know enough to be dangerous now to have that conversation with their family. And y'all can, whoever. <laughs> so. I normally will talk about the benefits that are available, talk about this is what home, home health offers. This is what palliative offers. And this is what hospice. But let's talk about three different programs. And I don't offer home health, but just to show you the differences and where does this fit in with your family? What are your goals? Mm -hmm. Where do you see yourself six months from now, three months from now? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think when they start setting goals and see the difference and try not to say that hospice word, which we know we have to legally. Right to tell somebody they're on hospice but if we can start just like doing in silos this, this is what's available to you what is your goals what would you like and so sometimes and we probably all have had it i put people on palliative and they've only been on palliative maybe for a week and say okay i want the hospice you know this is we're going to go forward but that that's my experience is trying because i've gone into family meetings that are pretty heated you know, and I just tell them, hey, I'm just here for education. I'm not here to sign anybody up. I'm just right. doing new options. You know, we kind of put on that social worker hat without the degree, right? I'm here just to kind of let you know what's available to you. Um, and this is your family and, and your decision. And sometimes the patient actually is able to make their own decision, you know. So, um, and that kind of takes the monkey off the back maybe for that adult daughter or that adult son that is not agreeing with the, the siblings or with the spouse is not agreeing, you know? Um, so that, that's the way I do it. If anybody else wants to share. I think just Linda, you hit it on the head and, you know, you explained to them that there is no pressure, you know, this is just education. Um, and I, I think that's the biggest aspect of it because anybody that feels pressured to do anything, that, that's not going to go well. Um, you know, it's free for me to come out and just have a conversation. And the, the worst thing is you'll have more of an education on what we talk about. You take your time, it has to feel right for you. I always say, you know, choosing the right company has to feel good here in your brain, as well as your heart, right? And that has yeah. to match. Um, and if that matches, you know, cause we're all different. We all have different things that we're able to provide. You know, my hospice company isn't the perfect one for every patient, and none of ours is. It's, it's, it's really a unique decision, and it has to feel good, like I said, in both of those places. If, if you were a sibling, you're not in the business now, but you know some stuff about it. How do you talk to your siblings before they introduce you? Any ideas? Any really? concept of what? Because what I'm saying is just basically... How do you have that that fear-based conversation, you know, that you can bring you in to explain? Do you have any idea? How do you coach somebody when you run into that situation? Say, for instance, you've got somebody that's got enough sense to know this, but they're afraid, you know, to have that conversation with their family. Do you help coach them on how to have that conversation to get in? Well, 
I mean, absolutely. You know, we can. I think once you know one person's eyes are open and they understand what, like, like Penny said, what hospice is, what hospice is not. Um, I've had I've had many people say, oh wow, well, if I'm eligible for that, I want that because they see what it covers. You know, right. um, but for that uh, sibling, you know, say, hey, you know. I, I, I've been introduced to a service that I think can really help mom and dad right now in the home. Um, we're not giving up control. It's just coming in, uh, providing extra help. Um, it is something that's covered 100%, so it's no additional expense. Um, but I'd like for you just to, just to, to see what they can provide, you know, what, uh, what that looks like, providing support and help for mom and dad, uh, or whatever the case may be in the home. Um, and, uh, you know, and and even push back say I know I know the word hospice is scary but uh, one, I, I was scared initially too but once I learned what it is and what it is not I really feel like uh, like we can get some great benefit out of this well thank you well, I'll tell you what I I've got to, oh, go ahead the other piece I would add to that exactly what Craig said is what I would say and then I would follow it up with this person who I spoke to said they'd be happy to explain it to you as well and because sometimes we have family member that's here taking care of the patient, but the other sibling who's causing the problem, not sure, lives in California, for instance. Mm -hmm. They haven't seen mom or dad most recently. They have no idea how they deteriorated or what's going on. But you know what? We're in this age where all you got to do is put your phone on. You don't even have to do Zoom. You can put your phone on and FaceTime with someone, and they can say, you know, hey, I know that you talked to my brother or sister about mom. I don't think they're that bad. And then this person can say, well, here's what I saw. And let me share with you what we would be able to offer mm -hmm. and them, you know, at ease because they're in another state. They haven't seen what's going on currently and they just don't want to accept maybe that that's happened to their parent, brother, sister, whoever, but you don't have to travel cross country to see them. You can FaceTime, you can zoom, you can Skype, you can do all kinds of things to really, make that person also feel part of, of the decision because that's the key piece here. So that everybody decides on it so that when something happens, they don't start blaming each other. So very true, Penny. Very good. Well, I will tell you what, it's getting to that time that I always ask this question to every, every panel I have. Okay. And if you have, you've got an opportunity right now to say something that you would always wanted to tell people, you wanted to grab by the lapels and go deck on it. You know, this is something you should know. Well, grab away, grab the lapels and say what you'd like to say before we get done here. Do you have something that we didn't cover that you really think somebody needs to hear, you know, that you'll be irritated if you, once we turn this thing off, go, gosh, I wish. So. I mean, I think we mentioned this before and I know I have, but I think this is the biggest thing is that, you know, hospice isn't just for the patients. It truly is for the family, the whole family unit that could even include aunts, uncles, grandparents, friends that might be family. Um, it is so important for people to understand that they don't have to do this alone as a caregiver, as a patient, um, that we become kind of a level of family to them and with them. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really a win-win with all of that extra help and support. Um, because like, again, when you support the family, the patient's going to do better or, or their needs are going to be met better because there's less family strife pain is controlled, emotional, um, any kind of emotional stuff that they had might be able to get resolved. Um, it's just encompassing, you know, the best quality for the patient and the family. I would say we are not giving up. And some people feel like they're failing because they've talked about hospice and that is failure is not it. it you're helping them live throughout this journey. And um, I think sometimes there's guilt with saying, mom, I think you need hospice. And uh, like, like Cheryl was saying, we're here for the entire family, but you are not giving up by any means. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I would say all of the above. <laughs> the thing that I always say to them is, you know, not, I don't want you to just focus on hospice as a word, but if you were in an auto accident and you needed the emergency room, you would go to emergency care. If you had a fracture, you would go to orthopedic care, whatever that might be. Now you have an illness, a terminal illness, and we have a wonderful program of care that's called hospice. And so we are here to serve your needs as if you were to go to any of those other programs of care. 
and they kind of just relax and think, okay, someone's here to take care of me. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just trying to get that scariness, if you will, off of their shoulders so that they can relax and say, okay, no, but everyone's scared if you go in the emergency room. You don't know what they're going to do to you. It's very frightening. It's also frightening if you say, I'm going on hospice. The, the difference is you can elect off of it if you want to, as Craig has already commented on. But if you just kind of make it so that they realize they've got a problem, there's a solution to help them with that problem, and a whole team that wants to help them with that problem, it alleviates the fear. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for me, we, we fit on this through most of this conversation is just for folks to really educate yourselves before it becomes something that you really need to consider. Um, I think it should be something to where it becomes less and less scary, like Penny said, if you do educate yourself on what the true benefits of, of hospice are and just kind of figuring out what, um, you know, what it can do to help you and your family and your loved ones. When, when you think about it, it's not something that is scary when you get down, get down to it. Um, recently, I had a conversation with a friend where we talked about how with childbirth, you spend all this time preparing. You spend you know, months before the baby comes, getting things ready and getting it in order, learning how to change diapers, how to make um, you know, specific blends of baby food and so on and so forth. Um, honestly, end of life should be very similar where before it's something that approaches, learn about it. Um, have a conversation with anyone on this panel. We're all more than happy to, Absolutely. to talk to whoever uh, about the benefits of hospice. And I mean, at the end of the day, it just, it, my mom passed away without hospice. My dad passed away with, and I mean, the, the difference was just the world. So it's definitely something I would tell people, you know, educate yourselves and have a conversation 20, 30 years before it becomes a necessity. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Well, I'm going to do a quick screen share real quick. I'll be back to you in just a second. I want to show some people something. Life's Copilot has these uh, panels coming up, and it's we just did the one today. On the 16th, we're doing one uh, at 6 p.m. It is a uh, it's, it was going to be at Five Star Residence at Noblesville, but COVID said no, so we're doing it on Zoom. But our hostess is still Wendy Carl from Five Star, and it's going to be kind of a generic pattern on all things senior. So different, you know, different uh, companies that come there. We have uh, oh, we have a new one coming up here that um, um, uh, just got added through Joyce House. We have one coming up here on the 22nd. That, the, the reason I paused, this wasn't here when we started this panel. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Um, and then uh, this one is when you build a house, you hire a general contractor, why not get uh, senior care ger uh, geriatric care managers? That's good. He's going to be here on the 22nd. The difference between home care and health care on the 8th of October. Uh, senior care is not what it uh, used to be on the 19th of October, and we have these continuing on a regular basis. So you can always go to Life's Copilot and find those. So that's available for everybody out here. I want to thank you, Penny, Linda, Craig, Cheryl, Mike. Thank you so much for being here. You guys were phenomenal. Thanks for putting up with my mush mouth today with my <laughs> mouthful of cotton. And I will tell you that the Novocaine is worn out, so I'm heading over to get my painkillers. <laughs> So anyway, so, uh, but thank you all for being here. Thanks and, for inviting uh, us. Awesome. Thanks for inviting us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.